Welcome, welcome everyone to the unveiling ceremony for the third set of statues for the Trail of Governors project. I am Jay DeVoe, I'm director of the South Dakota State Historical Society, which is a division of the Department of Tourism, and it is my privilege and pleasure to be your master of ceremonies this afternoon. Please join me in thanking Beverly Mickelson, our pianist, for providing us music before and following the program today. Now, Bev is, Bev is retired from working in the Adjutant General's office and Governor Michael Rounds' office. Nevertheless, she remains very, uh, re uh, remains very active and a talented musician and continues serving as an organist, choir accompanist, and bell choir director at First United Methodist Church here in Pierre. Thank you, Bev. I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's program for the Trail of Governors Foundation honors three former governors of the state of South Dakota with the unveiling of their statues, and we will also hear from our current governor, Dennis Dugard. I ask you now to please stand as the color guard comprised of Sergeants Rory Rogers and Braden Nelson and special, Specialist Michael Schwartz under the command of Staff Sergeant Aaron Starood of the South Dakota National Guard as they post the flags. Please remain standing after the presentation for the national anthem and invocation. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. The Reverend Dan Bader of the First United Methodist Church will offer an invocation. Will you pray with me? God of grace on this brisk and yet oh so beautiful November day, we're reminded of the beauty of your creation that surrounds us. We are so thankful and privileged and blessed to live in a land of freedom, a land we call our home. We've gathered this day remembering and honoring all those individuals have, who have stood boldly as leaders within our communities in our state, seeking to work together for the greater good of all who claim South Dakota as their home. Particularly, we remember the legacies of Governors Robert Vesey, Peter Norbeck, 
and George S. Mickelson, as they, like countless others, and like many who are yet to come, will continue to stand boldly making the commitment to serve the people who claim this rich and beautiful diversity of South Dakota. We lift our eyes in awe of the majesty of the Black Hills, to the wide open beauty of our prairies, to the richness of the farmlands which produces food and feeds our people, to those who live and work in our towns and communities, as well as those who live in places or lands where opportunities are much more limited. So this day we pray. We pray for all the people who claim the state of South Dakota as their home. And on this All Saints Day, we remember those who have fought to retain our freedoms, those who have labored for the rights of all people, and who have offered their hands, their hearts, their voices, and their lives in service. We ask, O oh God, that you would continue to guide us and guide our great state. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Bader. Now, an event of this consequence also needs music to help us celebrate. And you have already heard E.J. Mickelson is a superb vocalist. In his day job, Jay is in his 45th year of teaching Latin, German, history, and mythology at T.F. Riggs High School here in Pierre. That's right, his 45th year. Please welcome Jay Mickelson as he sings. As he sings, God Bless America, written by Irving Berlin and made famous by Kate Smith. Jay. Now, on the second time through the, the uh, chorus, I want you all to sing with me, all right? While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for our land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. Bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the ocean white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless. America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet
Thank you, Jay and Bev. Traditionally, the Trail of Governors Foundation unveils the new governor statues on Flag Day. And I'm one of those people who kind of gets misty-eyed when um, they have the, sing the national anthem, you see the flags everywhere. And so I just love doing it on that particular day. An already special day made extra special by having this take place. However, this past summer, crews were at work here in the Capitol, removing, repairing, and replacing the beautiful stained glass in the Capitol, which tonight we are going to light, and we're really excited about that. So it would have been practically and um, impossible to hold a ceremony here in the rotunda. In addition, this weekend, South Dakota, and by default, North Dakota, is... <laughs> is commemorating their 125th anniversary. So happy birthday, South Dakota. Every uh, events last night and throughout today, including this ceremony this afternoon, mark this momentous anniversary. All three of the governors we recognize today worked in this magnificent state capital. It represents the people's government. Important events took place here. Life-changing decisions were, are made here, and in short, History happens here. This morning we recognized our First Ladies um, when we rededicated the First Ladies Gowns exhibition on the first floor directly below us. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, I encourage you to stop down there and take a look. This afternoon we are honoring our South Dakota governors, 32 to date. These men have led our great state and helped shape our state's history. We have such a dignified dignitary-filled audience today of statewide elected officials, cabinet officials, state legislators, and many others, and I thank you all for attending today. Nevertheless, I do need to make a few introductions. I'd like to introduce um, Governor Frank Farrar. Please stand. First Lady, Mary Dean Janklow. First Lady, Lyndon Mickelson Graham. <laughs> Governor Walter Dale and First Lady, Pat Miller. <laughs> Current Governor, Dennis and First Lady, Linda Dugard. I'm Lieutenant Governor Matt and Karen Michaels. And Chief Justice David Gilbertson. Today we are specializing, especially memorializing Governors Robert Vesey, Peter Norbeck, and George S. Mickelson, the third set of three governors to be included in the Trail of Governors here in the city of Pierre. The trail currently includes the statues of Governors Arthur Millette, Harlan Bushfield, Frank Farrar, Harvey Woolman, William J. Janklow, and Walter Dale Miller. But the trail starts with Rick Jensen, president of the Tra Trail of Governors Foundation. Rick is a native South Dakotan who left the farm and joined the United States Air Force. He was going to see the world. He ended up in Florida where he worked in financial investment and management. And in 2007, he had the good sense to return home and return to South Dakota with his wife, Anna. And he continues to work in finance as a financial advisor, investing in historic real estate and business enterprises, and became very involved in the capital city communities. Please welcome Rick Jensen. Well, thank you, Jay. What a birthday party. I didn't think I'd ever celebrate a birthday any older than Mansoor. You had a birthday this summer. I went to your party. This, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, it is my distinct honor to address you as president of the Board of Governors Foundation. Uh, this wonderful crowd here celebrating 125 years of statehood. 
and we're doing so by honoring three state leaders. Their bronze images will soon grace the streets of our beautiful capital city. The project began as just a sidewalk conversation and a dream with myself and another uh, pure business owner, and has since then taken on an entire life of its own, mainly through volunteers, uh, donors, both individuals, family donors, um, businesses, and it's just, uh, it's really rewarding to see it uh, uh, come to fruition like this. So with that, let me introduce to you my fellow foundation board members here from the Pier and Fort Pier area. And as if I call your name, if you please stand to be recognized. And also, if you can hold the applause until the end, just for the sake of time. Uh, Patricia Adam. Thank you. Leroy Foster. Patricia Miller. Chuck Schroyer. Tina Van Camp, and Patricia Van Gerpen. Thank you very much. Without you guys, this would not happen. And now I'd like to, I'd wish to uh, recognize another key support group. It's our advisory board members, and they're located throughout the state. Uh, Brian Allen. Delory Davis. Delory's our artist liaison. You know, we need somebody to, you know how artists are, you know, kind of, we need somebody to, to stand between us. <laughs> You'll get to meet them soon. <laughs> Bradley Anderson, not sure if he's here. Brooke Bonenkamp, she's our liaison with the city of Pier. Marshall Damgard. Tom Farnsworth. He's with the City of Pier Park and Rec, and he helps us with the uh, installation of the statues. Jacqueline Dice Johnson. Stephanie Judson, who you'll meet in a minute here. She's uh, invaluable with our relationship with the South Dakota Community Foundation. Paul Kinsman and Michael Mueller. They are our liaisons with the state of South Dakota, so thank you. And, And how could I forget Tony Van Heusen? He's our, he's our historian and the advisory board. I don't know if Tony's here. All right, with today's unveiling, this will be completed nine statues, as Jay said. And we've raised over $717,000 of the approximately $2 million that will be needed for the 31 statues. Um, so we're really well on our way, and we're excited to announce the fundraising effort for next year's class of 2015. And those governors will be Governor Harriet, Governor George T. Mickelson, and Governor Richard Kneipp. A new opportunity has also been created, and it's the endowment fund. So if you have a hard-to-find person on your Christmas list to see any of these people that just stood up, <laughs> I'd be happy to help you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge a few folks that continue to support and encourage the Trail of Governors. A peer mayor, Lori Gill. Uh, we have South Dakota beginning with Governor Dugard and, and the First Lady and, and your staff. BPRO is our uh, web developers, and if you haven't been on it, uh, trailofgovernors.com, I would encourage you to follow that and keep up to date with the latest news. And also our underwriters, Leroy Foster at Dakota Prairie Bank, President Steve Hayes, that helps keep the continuity of the project. So without them, it still would be a dream. Also, the, uh, these three lead leaders we honor today had a lot in common. They were innovative, effective, and dignified, as history will attest. And I think today this project is a fitting tribute to their, these leaders. And also, thank you for being here to live South Dakota history. And I'd like to announce on behalf of the board of directors that we gift these current set of statues upon placement to the city of Pierre. Thank you, Rick.
It took three elections to determine once and for all that Pierre would indeed be the capital city. Lori Gill is the mayor of Pierre. Mayor Gill has worked in the nonprofit healthcare field and state government. She currently serves as Governor Dugard's Commissioner of Human Relations Resources. Mayor Gill also served as the city commissioner prior to being elected mayor in 2008. Please welcome the capital city mayor, Lori Gill. Good afternoon. It is so great to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming to this wonderful ceremony. It's so nice to be with you all today for the Trail of Governors third unveiling ceremony. And I'm so honored to represent Pierre, home of the state capitol and the nation's only Trail of Governors. Today, Governors Robert Vesey, Peter Norbeck, and George S. Mickelson will join the ranks of six other South Dakota state governors who are already memorialized throughout our community by life-size statues. These statues have become very dear to us. In fact, they've become our friends and our comrades as we go about our daily lives, and some of them even get dressed up according to the seasons. <laughs> What a wonderful asset to the city of Pierre and a fitting genuflection to the leaders who not only helped shape our great state but also our great community of Pierre. I'm pleased that Pierre can serve as host to many friends and family members today and descendants of the governors who are here for this ceremony. Thank you for being here. I hope the community of Pierre holds a special place for you as you hold a special place for us. I would be remiss if I also did not take a couple of moments to recognize those community leaders who initiated the Trail of Governors, and we've already heard uh, their names mentioned, but Rick Jensen and Leroy Foster. Uh, we, we heard Rick mention that this started as a sidebar conversation. It was those two guys, and they were talking about this dream and this vision of what could be for Trail of Governors, and that's where I entered into this. I had a meeting on my schedule one day, and I walked in. I knew those two guys were going to be there in my office, I wasn't sure quite what it was about. And what they wanted to do is talk to me about this vision of this project. And that is how some things happen. It's an idea at a grassroots level that takes root. And look at this today, we've really come a long way. These two guys, thank you gentlemen, you had a vision to enhance our community by retelling local and state history with a collection of art. You showed up in my office wanting to discuss your dream. And although you've only been at this a few years, we can all agree that you've accomplished a great deal and added another layer of historic beauty to our community. Congratulations to you two gentlemen, to your boards, and to your volunteers. And then we have the talent. The sculptors who are literally shaping city and state legacy one governor at a time. Lee, Sherry, and Michael, all I can say is wow, and you're all going to say wow in a few minutes. I can't wait to see what you've got in store for us today. Again, thank you. Thank you to the family and friends uh, for letting Pierre share in the legacy of Governor Vesey, Governor Norbeck, and Governor Mickelson. Thank you to the Trail of Governors Foundation members and donors, and thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Mayor. Since 1987, the South Dakota Community Foundation has helped people reach their philanthropic goals and strengthen communities by making charitable donations do more. As a partner with the Trail of Governors Foundation, they have enabled the foundation to meet their objective of annually recognizing three governors by erecting statues in their honor. Stephanie Judson, president of the South Dakota Community Foundation, is going to tell us about these men and introduce the artists who created their respective statues. A South Dakota native, Stephanie has been with the foundation, foundation since 1997, serving in numerous capacities. Currently, she oversees strategic vision, donor relations, and grant program development. Please welcome Stephanie Judson.
Good afternoon and thank you. I've had several of you ask me my, about my role here today, and I guess suffice it to say that I get to endorse what a, a strong educational system South Dakota has because I get to read um, some bios expertly prepared by Tony Van Usen. Thank you. Um, governor Robert Skadden Vesey, seventh governor of South Dakota, years in office 1909 through 1913. Born May 16, 1858, in Winnebago County, Wisconsin. He passed away in October 18th in Pasadena, California of 1929. Robert S. Vesey grew up on his family's farm near Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where he attended common schools and briefly enrolled in Oshkosh Commercial College. His father, Charles, was a lay Methodist minister who emigrated from England along with his wife, Jane Elizabeth. Beginning at age 16, Vesey worked for five years as a lumberjack in northern Wisconsin. Then, after traveling to Kansas and Texas to work as a laborer, returned to Wisconsin as a lumber crew foreman. Vesey married Florence Albert, whom he met when she worked for her father in 1882. The following year, the Vesties left Wisconsin for a squatter's claim in Gerald County, South Dakota, where they raised sheep and constructed a house. Vesey was an imposing figure at six feet tall. Two years later, Vesey moved to Westington Springs due to his wife's failing health, and he joined the mercantile firm of Vesey Brothers Ransom and Company. They later changed the name to Albert and Vesey. He continued his involvement in ranching while being a merchant, gradually moving from raising sheep to cattle and establishing the R.S. Vesey Cattle Company. He and Jane Elizabeth raised four children, Harry, Vera, Bernice, and Robert Jr., a successful businessman who valued free enterprise. Vesey was a founder of the South Dakota Retailers Association. He also served as president of Westington Springs State Bank. Vesey was elected to the state senate in 1904 and served as president pro tempore of the body in 1907 and in 1908. He was a close supporter of Governor Crow Crawford, and when Crawford decided to forego a second term as governor to run for U.S. Senate, he swung progressive Republican support for the governor's chair to Vesey. The new governor took oath in his office in the former state capitol building called the Sheep Shed by peer residents. The large new capitol building was under construction when Vesey took office in 1909. He continued his to pursue a progressive platform. He pushed for increased railroad regulation and for higher taxes on railroads. He supported progressively morality laws, including a prohibition of gambling and drinking on passenger trains, anti-profanity laws, and a ban on providing free liquor on election day. <laughs> this. <laughs> Vesey was the first to occupy the governor's office in the new state capitol, moving into it in 1910. The impressive new capitol structure was built at a cost of approximately $800,000. Vesey has become the first governor in America to proclaim Mother's Day, which he did by executive proclamation in 1909. He was the first governor to supervise the Department of Game, Fish, and Parks, created by the legislature, and the Chinese ring-neck pheasant became a protected species under his new state agency. After two years as governor, Vesey declined to run for the U.S. Senate and returned to private business. He eventually left South Dakota, moving to Southern California, where he continued in real estate and died in Pasadena, California in 1929. I would like to now introduce the sculptors of Governor Vesey's statue, Lee Luding and Sherry Treby, to the stage. Well, Sherry can't be here, but uh, I'm enough <laughs> anyway. You know, it's, it's, people don't understand. They say, don't you get nervous talking in front of all those governors and first ladies and Supreme Court judges? And, I said, no, it's peer. They're my neighbors. <laughs> I, I say terrible things in front of them <laughs> all the time, and they're just like neighbors. They're pals, and that's the way this city is. Um, as a retired game warden that served here in Pier, I got to meet many of them many times over. I, I was coming into Griffin Bay to the, the dock, and there was a big blue London in front of me, and I eased up on it. I was notorious for that. 
a kind of a turtle race, and I grabbed the gunwale and I said, "Game and fish." And when, just when I said it, I noticed the coffee cup said Governor Mickelson. <laughs> <laughs> but he just got his license right out. I mean, that's the kind of people this town is full of. And as an artist, there's something I've noticed, and I'm going to point it out to our visitors and probably some of our own residents about how beautiful this city is and why it has such a wonderful vista. Any ideas? There is no power lines. Think about it. You go to Sioux Falls and so other nice cities, so you've got these ugly power lines everywhere. But we have the great views of the Missouri breaks, so to me that's, that's a very meaningful, beautiful city. Um, so when I want to talk about Vesey, we have a lot in common because he started the game in fish. And uh, well, except for the liquor on election day and that other thing, <laughs> we, don't, we don't totally agree on everything, but. <laughs> It's a small world. My son's mother-in-law, Lois Feissner, is here. She's the a nice lady with a delegation from uh, Washington Springs. And the person that lives in his home is here. Would you stand? These folks. And I think that's just great, because they're good friends with my, my son's mother-in-law. That's how small this city is. So Vesey is was faced with a rig problem. The reason he joined and helped form the South Dakota Board of Realtors is that they were getting attacked from outside, just like our local merchants are now by the internet and the online purchases. Only it was snail mail wise, back then the Sears and Roebuck were taking over a huge amount of their market and the local merchants were getting hammered by it. And so that inspired me. I, if you know my artwork, we don't do pieces that you tend to forget right away. We like to make at least 30 second artwork. That modern stuff I call two second artwork. That's how long it takes to walk by it. But there's no art professors in here, so I can pull that off. <laughs> So we, we wanted to create a sculpture that, that talks to his roots, what kind of man he was, what kind of presence, and, and what it took to be accepted by the other pioneers, because if they're like my German homesteader relatives, they were pretty ornery. So you had to develop a personal relationship with them. And that's what South Dakotans do, so that's what this piece is. So it's not a guy in a suit. And all the guys and governors in suits here are a lot more dimensions than that suit and tie, and you won't see many suits done by, by, by Sherry and I. There'll be something to their character. So with that, Governor Vesey. I'll call up the family. Thank you, Lee. The statue of Robert Vesey is a gift to the people of South Dakota from the South Dakota Retailers Association, Ronald and Linda Olinger, and Gus and John Ritchie, um, Sean Lyons, the Long Monk, Ron Olinger, and Jerry Wheeler will unveil a statue along with the artist Lee Looning. Thank you very much. Um, Governor Vesey's statue will be in front of the South Dakota Retailer Association's office on the corner over here of Capitol and Nicollet. The beauty of it is, is that he's actually can see, we'll see where he'd be overlooking where the old Capitol building used to be that he also had an office in before moving in to this building. Um, Stephanie will continue with the biography of Peter Norbeck. Governor Peter Norbeck, ninth governor of South Dakota, serving from 1917 to 1921, born August 27, 1870 in Clay County, South Dakota. 
died December 20, 1936, in Redfield, South Dakota. Peter Norbeck, South Dakota's first native-born governor, was the son of Scandinavian immigrants. He was born in a dugout at his parents' homestead. Norbeck's father, a Lutheran lay pastor, moved the family to Charles Mix County in 1885. Here Norbeck met Lydia Anderson, whose family attended Norbeck's church. The couple married in 1900 and had four children, Nellie, Ruth, Harold, and Selma. Norbeck attended the University of South Dakota for three terms. In 1892, his father bought him a well digging machine, which Norbeck improved, allowing him to dig wells inexpensively. He moved to Redfield and founded the Artesian Well Company, becoming the largest well drilling business in five states, drilling more than 12,000 wells. Norbeck entered politics in 1908, when elected to the state senate. In three terms, he sponsored progressive reform legislation and in 1914 was elected lieutenant governor. Norbeck was elected governor in 1916 and led an activist progressive Republican administration. He promoted state-owned enterprises, including the state cement plant, state hail insurance, and hydroelectric commission. He supported the women's suffrage movement and the prohibition of alcohol. Norbeck led the state during World War I, leading efforts to sell war bonds, aid draft boards, and conserve food and fuel. The governor shared a birthday of October 27 with President Theodore Roosevelt, whom he called his idol and ideal. And like Roosevelt, he vigorously promoted conservation efforts. As governor, Norbeck founded Custer State Park, the state's first state park. He named himself chairman of the State Park Board and personally oversaw the development. Norbeck also initiated a progressive program on highway construction, naming himself chairman of the State Highway Commission. An avid sportsman, Norbeck held the state's first hunting season for the Chinese ringneck pheasant and authorized a state purchase and release program to boost the pheasant population. After two successful terms as governor, Norbeck was elected to the United States Senate in 1920. During his 16 years in the Senate, he wrote the Migratory Waterfall Act and pushed for the creation of the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Norbeck continued to promote South Dakota as a U.S. Senator. He brought Guts and Borglum to South Dakota to carve Mount Rushmore and insisted that his hero, Theodore Roosevelt, be included on the memorial. In addition to Mount Rushmore, Norbeck aided in the development of Iron Mountain Road, Sylvan Lake, and the Needles Highway, Wind Cave National Park, and Badlands National Monument. He also promoted the Black Hills in 1927 when he convinced President Calvin Coolidge to make the State Game Lodge his summer White House. Norbeck died in Redfield on December 20th, 1936. He is memorialized at the state capitol with a bronze bust by Borglum in the state senate lobby and the Black Hills by Custer State Park's Peter Norbeck Visitor Center, the Black Hills National Forest Norbeck Wildlife Preserve, and the Peter Norbeck Scenic Byway, which runs through Custer State Park near Mount Rushmore. Here to tell us about his work on Governor Norbeck's statue, James Michael Mahar. Well, thank you. I, I can't tell you what an honor it is for me to be here again and how much I appreciate the opportunity that is afforded me again this year. I'd like to thank the Trail of Governors Committee especially, because they are just the best committee I've ever had to work with on any project that I've had, and they just do a great job. As you can see here, it's, it's a wonderful ceremony that they put on. Unlike Lee, I'm a little nervous up here talking in front of you. I, it's not because I'm not familiar with Pierre and haven't gotten to know all of you. I think it may go to our natures are a little bit different. I don't think Lee would be nervous anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, this year I got to do Peter Norbeck, who was one of the governors that I had on my list to do right from the start. Although I, at that time I didn't know as much about him as I would after I researched him a little bit. He's probably, more than any other governor in our past, 
carries a legacy on down through the years, as Stephanie was saying, all the things that he had done. Even before he was governor, just the artesian well drilling that he did changed the face of South Dakota for so many. Um, that would have been a tremendous legacy. But I think today that may be largely taken for granted. But one thing that will never be taken for granted, I think, is what he did in Custer State Park and for Mount Rushmore. Um, there he really created a jewel, not just for South Dakota, but for the whole nation. And his involvement in those projects was really hands-on. Um, he got involved in laying out the Needles Highway and Iron Mountain Road. Sometimes he went, he was at odds with the engineers who said, we couldn't build there, we couldn't, we couldn't put a highway there. But he insisted on it because it would be the most beautiful route to take. And his insistence, his building of those highways and, and doing it so well earned him the title Poet of the Park from South Dakota Poet Laureate Badger Clark. Norbeck himself said he'd rather be remembered as an artist than as a politician. So taking that into consideration is where I found the inspiration for this sculpture. Thank you. Thank you. The statue of Governor Peter Norbeck is a gift to the people of South Dakota from Jim Jennings, David and Rebecca Scott, and Margaret Cash Wagner, who will help the artists unveil the statue now. Please come on up. Thank you. Governor Norbeck's statue will join Governors Harlan Bushfields and Governor Harvey Woolman's statue in downtown Pierre, and he will be located at the corner of Dakota Avenue and Pierre Street. I'll return the program back over to Stephanie. Governor George Speaker Mickelson, 28th Governor of South Dakota, serving from 1987 to 1993. Born January 31, 1941 in Mobridge, South Dakota. Died April 19, 1993 near Dubuque, Iowa. George S. Mickelson spent his early years in Selby. He was born during the 1941 legislative session when his father, George T. Mickelson, served as Speaker of the House of Representatives. The elder Mickelson intended to have his son share his middle name, Theodore, but at the urging of fellow representatives, the baby was instead named George Speaker, recognizing his father's position. The elder Mickelson went on to serve as attorney general, governor, and federal district judge. The family moved to Sioux Falls, where George S. attended Washington High School. A fellow Washington High School student, Linda McCarran, who Mickelson married in 1963, the Mickelsons had three children, Mark, Amy, and David. Mickelson graduated from the University of South Dakota in Business Administration in 1963 and earned his law degree from USD in 1965. He joined the U.S. Army serving in Vietnam and was discharged as a captain in 1967. After working as an assistant attorney general, Mickelson moved to Brookings and joined a private law practice. He served as Brookings County State's Attorney and was elected to the House of Representatives in 1974. Like his father, he served as Speaker of the House. Mickelson was elected Governor in 1986, making the Mickelsons the only father-son duo to serve as South Dakota Governor. His opponent, Democrat Lars Herseth, also was the son of a former Governor. The new Governor promoted economic development efforts, creating the Ready Revolving Loan Fund and the Future Fund. 
Mickelson created the Department of Tourism, launched the Great Faces, Great Places promotion campaign, and initiated the conversion of an old Black Hills Railroad line into a bicycle trail that now bears his name. He implemented the state lottery and Deadwood Gaming after the voters' approval in 1986. Mickelson led the state's Celebrate the Century Centennial celebrations in 1986, including the opening of the new Cultural Heritage Center, and led the founding of the South Dakota Community Foundation. Recognizing the need for improving racial relations, Mickelson declared 1990 as the Year of Reconciliation and is remembered for his outreach to South Dakota Native Americans. Governor Mickelson died with seven others on April 19, 1993, when a state plane crashed near Dubuque, Iowa. The eight men were returning from Cincinnati, Ohio, where they had met with the owners of the John Morrell and Company packing plant in Sioux Falls. The first South Dakota governor to die in office, Mickelson was the first to lie in state in the state capitol. The state commissioned the Fighting Stallions Memorial on the capitol grounds in memory of him and the other plane crash victims. The granite base of the memorial includes the following inscription in memory of Mickelson. South Dakota was just a century old when a new leader emerged. Eyes sparkling with vision, he embraced life. His smile created instant friendships, his devotion to family inspired. With limitless energy and genuine compassion, he challenged us to realize bigger dreams. George Mickelson made a difference. I'd like to invite James Michael Maher back to the podium to talk about his work on Governor Mickelson's statue. Thank you very much. Governor Mickelson was another one that was on my list that I wanted to do right from the start. And as I've <clears throat> said previously in the earlier years, one thing that I try to do when I'm, I'm doing a portrait sculpture is try to bring out the personality of the, of the subject. So in getting to do that, I talked with uh, Linda and Pat and Amy and got to know as much as I could about their views their memories of the governor. And we kind of went back and forth with a couple of different ideas. Governor Mickelson loved to hunt. He loved the camaraderie of the, of the hunt, being out waterfowling or pheasant hunting. We, so we thought about portraying him in his hunting gear. But that might be just a little too informal. So he was very serious about his work as a lawyer and of course as the governor of the state. And he liked to dress well, so maybe we should have him in a suit. But that might seem just a little too stiff for someone who was, had such a warm and engaging personality. So I was thinking about these things, and I was talking it over with a friend of mine in Rapid City who is an artist and has maybe a kind of a singular perception of things. And he told me a story that he had seen, he had been sitting in a restaurant across from the Alex Johnson Hotel. And he saw this man come out of the Alex Johnson Hotel with his sport coat or his suit coat slung over his shoulder, walking down the street and greeting people as he went. And he didn't know who that man was, a big man. But he said, I could see, and I said out loud, that man loves his job. And then someone told him, well, that's Governor Mickelson. And so he told me that story. And I thought, that really sums him up. He loved his job. He loved the state of South Dakota. So that's what I've tried to portray in this sculpture that we have today. Thank you. Thank you again. The statue of Governor George S. Mickelson is a gift to the people of South Dakota from Linda Mickelson Graham and family. 
Please welcome the former First Lady, Linda Mixon Graham, and the children, Amy, Mark, and David, to assist the artists in unveiling the statue. Thank you. Governor Mickelson's statue will be placed on Capitol Avenue in the vicinity of the Fighting Stallions Memorial. The Trail of Governors Foundation, working with the City of Pierre and state government, determined the locations for the statues. These three statues will be placed in their locations on Monday. Um, on a day such as today, seeing the United States flags everywhere, unveiling these statues, and commemorating our state's anniversary. And being here in this beautiful capital with its restored stained glass, we should even be more proud to be South Dakotans. 125 years ago, this Sunday, on November 2nd, 19, excuse me, 1889, South Dakota became a state with the flourish of the president's pen. We have that pen on exhibit at the South Dakota Cultural Heritage Center, and I encourage you to stop up this afternoon if you have time to take a look at that pen, the statehood banners, and other memorabilia regarding our statehood. The state of South Dakota had a humble beginnings, as did our current governor, Dennis Dugard. He grew up on the family between Gerritsen and Dell Rapids, started his education in a one-room schoolhouse, and after working his way through college and law school and working in Chicago for three years, he returned home to South Dakota and married Linda Schmidt. They bought the family farm site and there raised their three children, Laura, Sarah, and Chris. Governor Dugard served in the state senate and as lieutenant governor prior to being elected governor in 2010. Although Governor Dugard is unassuming, he's pretty tricky. And that's not because last night was Halloween. <laughs> the Dugards are really good friends with Governor Jack and First Lady Betsy Dalrymple of North Dakota. And we won't hold that against it, but they are they're really good friends. And earlier this fall, or this, the Dalrymples invited the Governor and First Lady to Bismarck for some preliminary anniversary celebratory events. And with the assistance of the two state historical societies, Governor Dugard offered to bring the pen used by President Benjamin Harrison to sign the statehood documents for North Dakota and South Dakota. And they, he allowed them to display that pen for four hours. <laughs> Now, when they unveiled this, this, this temporary exhibit, um, Governor Dalrymple offered a souvenir pin, a souvenir pin with his name on it in exchange for the Harrison pin. <laughs> oh, but Governor Dugard, ever the clever one, thanked him for the offer of the new pin. And actually, then Dalrymple offered him a whole box of pins. And, but Governor Dugard made it abundantly clear that the Harrison pin was returning home to South Dakota. And he just thought they might kind of want to see it. But we have it. So welcome, please welcome the 32nd governor of South Dakota, Dennis Dugard. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's true, we had that pen up in North Dakota. I was a little disappointed that President Harrison had forgotten to put the cap back on it. So it really, and I didn't realize they had big pens back then. So <laughs> This is a great day to celebrate our three governors. And let's, again, thank by 
uh, start by thanking the creators of the Trail of Governors, uh, Rick Jensen, Leroy Foster, and the whole board of directors of the Trail of Governors. Thank you all. And of course, uh, a great idea starts out as just an idea, and then it takes collaboration from others to support. And of course, this wouldn't be possible without the cooperation of the City of Pierre as they accept the donation of these statues. They also accept the responsibility of maintaining them. So we thank the City of Pierre. We also thank the artists who've given of their creativity and who've worked with the families to create uh, likenesses that embody the spirit of these governors and also the donors. Uh, it takes money, it takes time, it takes treasure for these uh, concepts and visions to be transformed into reality. So let's thank the city of Pier, the artists and the donors for making this all come together. And we also thank the family members for their sacrifice, for helping uh, identify the vision that would capture their family member, and for the sacrifices they made during the public servants that their family member gave, because they sacrificed even as their family members sacrificed. Thank you for your sacrifice. Our governors today are both unique in some ways and similar in some ways. They're unique among all governors. Today we're honoring the only governor whose career began as a lumberjack and then became a shepherd. We're also honoring the only governor who put the state $57 million into debt and still remained popular. <laughs> and also the only governor who served his country in Vietnam. These governors are also similar though because all believed in the quality of an idea it was the quality of an idea that mattered most. Becoming governor elevated each above politics to become true public servant leaders, caring about and making decisions in favor of what they believed people wanted and needed. We sometimes think of people who are leaders as giving orders, leading the way through directing. But real leadership is about creating ideas for improvement, setting goals, deploying resources effectively, building alliances, inspiring people to support the ideas, and creating urgency to move things ahead, and then persisting to getting things done. And of course, the courage to create new opportunities, even though some of those efforts may sometimes fail. It takes courage. Our three governors today demonstrated all of those qualities. Governor Robert Vesey, probably the least well-known governor today, became governor when South Dakota was still a teenager. Our state was only 19 years old. As a state senator and as governor, Robert Vesey was an, an enthusiastic supporter of President Teddy Roosevelt's progressive policies. Vesey's efforts in better regulation of railroads and taxation on railroads were already mentioned. But the people really liked it when Vesey won the fight for uniform passenger rates on railroads. The rate was set at two cents a mile per person. So a trip from Pier to Sioux Falls would cost only about $4.40, inflated to today about $50. No driving, no big trucks to avoid, no roadkill, just sit back and relax. Not bad. Not bad, those were the good old days. Vesey was also a job creator. John Morell and Company opened their doors during Vesey's time as governor. Vesey became the first governor to win his party's nomination in the first primary election in 1908. However, he became the Republican front runner in a very unusual way. When Governor Crow Crawford announced in 1907 that he would seek election to the U.S. Senate, instead of running for governor a second time, there were three equally qualified popular Republicans interested in being governor, including State Senator Robert Vesey. Not wanting a split in his party, Governor Crawford asked all three potential candidates to agree that after Crawford 
picked his favorite, the other two would not run. And all three agreed. To make his choice, and this is surprising to me, Governor Crawford called together his political friends and advisors. Each wrote a name down on a piece of paper, and those pieces of paper were put in a hat. And Governor Crawford pulled the name out of a hat, and it was Robert Vesey. Literally, his candidacy for governor was pulled out of a hat. <laughs> And the other two frontrunners kept their promises and did not run. Vesey won the primary against someone else and breezed to an easy victory that fall. As governor, as you heard, Governor Vesey was unafraid of legislation that involved morality and decisions about morality. He was successful in passing new laws to prohibit gambling and drinking on passenger trains, to outlaw profanity, and to stop the providing of free liquor to voters on election day. Now, I wasn't sure if the last law would increase turnout or decrease turnout. I wasn't sure which it would do. And as was mentioned earlier, Governor Vesey was the first governor to occupy this beautiful building when it was brand new. Governor Vesey's leadership moved South Dakota forward. His hard work made our political campaigns more transparent and gave voting power to the people with the creation of the primary system. His better regulation of the railroads made it easier for South Dakotans to succeed in business and get their harvests and cattle to market. And in spite of two years of drought, he helped the economy grow substantially with new businesses like Morell's. Thank you, Governor Vesey, for what you did to create the South Dakota we have today. <laughs> governor Peter Norbeck, our next governor, served 28 years in state and federal elective office. That public service has been equaled by only one other leader in South Dakota history. He's here today, Governor Walter Dale Miller. Thank you, Governor. Peter Norbeck became governor in 1917. Like Governor Vesey, Peter Norbeck's first home in South Dakota was a homestead. He was also very successful in business. He was also a Teddy Roosevelt progressive Republican who believed it was the duty of government to intervene and help people when they really needed help. That's why he successfully proposed changes to our laws and constitution that allowed the state government to own and operate businesses, such as was mentioned earlier, the state coal mine, the state hail insurance office, the rural credits program to loan money to farmers, and the state cement plant. The coal mine and the state hail insurance program had limited success but were discontinued. The Rural Credits Program saved many family farms, but put the state $57 million into debt and was stopped. The state cement plant was a big success for many years. Of course, Governor Norbeck is well known for his activist and hands-on support of parks, wildlife refuges, and conservation. Lesser well known are his enormous, enormous achievements in road building. Of course, as was mentioned earlier, he wanted to be sure that the Game, Fish, and Parks Commission and the State Highway Commission made good decisions that he approved. So he appointed himself chair of both of those boards. Now that's hands-on. <laughs> he also worked for 20 years to create Custer State Park, the largest park, the largest state park in the United States. He even designed as is depicted here, many of the roads in the park himself and helped construct fences himself. That's really hands-on. Governor Norbeck even put people first in designing the roads, like the Iron Martin Road. Instead of the shortest route, which was about nine miles, Governor Norbeck created a beautiful 16-mile road with fantastic views of Mount Rushmore and the Black Hills. Several of Governor Norbeck's greatest accomplishments are really interconnected. As a successful businessman, he owned an automobile. 
And as cars became more affordable to the average family in America, Governor Norbeck realized the potential. If you have beautiful parks and places with sights to see and interesting things to do, such as the Black Hills and Custer State Park, and if you have excellent highways on which families can afford to drive cars, then you'll have created a tourism industry. And that's what Governor Norbeck did. He even created the state-owned cement plant to provide the cement to build those highways that would bring, ultimately, millions and millions of people to the Black Hills every year. And after being governor, he didn't stop. On Gutzen Borglum's second trip to South Dakota, Senator Peter Norbeck was there with him to help pick the mountain upon which the mountain carving Mount Rushmore would be built, would be created. Then, in 1927, Senator Norbeck convinced President Calvin Coolidge to spend a few weeks in the Black Hills. And as you know, those few weeks turned into three months because Calvin Coolidge loved the Black Hills so much. This brought significant positive publicity to South Dakota from all the national reporters because, of course, Silent Cal would never say a thing in the presence of the press, so they had to write about something. They wrote about the Black Hills. The people's affection for Peter Norbeck was seen in their referring to him as Pete when he was governor, and later years in the Senate, Old Pete. Thank you, Governor Norbeck, for what you did to create the South Dakota we have today. <laughs> governor George S. Mickelson, like Governors Vesey and Norbeck, our third governor uh, today, began public service as a state legislator. One very unusual event connects Governors Norbeck and Mickelson. When the legislators were debating the Norbeck Highway Commission, they were running out of time. It was approaching midnight on the last day of session. During a break, when most of the members left the floor, someone mysteriously turned back the clock in the chambers, which allowed more debate and ultimately passage of the Highway Commission bill. Many years later, Speaker of the House George Mickelson was presiding over the House and it was approaching midnight on the last day of session in 1979. A bill needed to be passed, but the votes weren't there yet. Speaker Mickelson announced a break. When almost everyone left the chambers, he climbed on a chair, stretched his six foot five inch, eighth of a ton body as high as he could and covered the clock. Can you picture that? As a legislator, Representative Mickelson, then Representative Mickelson, believed it was the duty of government to intervene and help people when they really needed it, even if it meant suspending time for a while. He held that same belief as governor, doing what he thought the people needed and wanted, even if it might jeopardize his political future. What government in his right mind, in his first legislative session, would propose a 20% increase in state sales tax, however temporary, to raise money for economic development? Newly sworn in Governor George S. Mickelson proposed it, legislators approved it, and the people agreed. And that's why we have the Ready Fund today. It has helped hundreds of businesses start and expand in South Dakota and created thousands of jobs since 1987. What governor in his right mind would propose an increase in the gas tax by five cents a gallon to boost the fixing of our highways? Governor Mickelson did, the legislature approved, and people agreed, and our highways were improved. In both cases, Governor Mickelson was was in his right mind. The political pundits didn't think it was, so. it was so, but the people knew he was because they wanted more jobs and better highways. When a staffer described the potential negative fallout on a proposal, Governor Mickelson said, I'd rather be a one-term governor and do what's right than play safe just to be here longer. 
A lawyer I know recently recalled that about 25 years ago, he heard that Governor Mickelson was in the building where he worked. A few minutes later, Governor Mickelson happened to walk by his office door, and then stopped, walked in, and introduced himself. They had a nice conversation. The lawyer said later, you know, he didn't have to do that. He was governor, he had more important things to do, but he did it. He was nice to a young guy he didn't even know. Governor Mickelson did things like that his entire life. He cared about people. Another South Dakotan said he was working in another state and he wanted to come home. And Governor Mickelson called up that man's boss and gave him the sales pitch. That phone call created 200 jobs in South Dakota and the young man was able to come home and work here. Economic development, sure. But it happened because Governor Mickelson wanted to help a young man come home. He accomplished so much in such a short period of time. For the same reasons that people called Peter Norbeck, Pete, even today, over 20 years later, when South Dakotans say George, you know who they mean. His smile created instant friendships. Thank you, Governor Mickelson, for what you did to create the South Dakota we have today. Looking back at all three of these governors, I think President Teddy Roosevelt would say, bully for them, <laughs> bully for them. These men are no longer our governors, but in, in a sense, they still are. Today, tomorrow, and for all of South Dakota's future, Governor Vesey, Governor Norbeck, and Governor Mickelson will still be with us because their accomplishments live on. We are grateful to all three of these governors. We are a better state, and we are a better people because of them. Thank you, Governor Dugard. And thank you all for attending today's unveiling of the, for the Trail of Governors project. For those of you who want to learn more about our former first governors and first ladies, the South Dakota State Historical Society has published two booklets, First Lady Inaugural Gowns and Governors Portraits, available in the Heritage Stores, both here in this building, the Capitol, and at the Cultural Heritage Center. In conclusion, Jay Mickelson will sing, Hail South Dakota, a great state of the land. South Dakota's official state song. Please stand. Hail South Dakota, a great state of the land. And beauty, that's what makes her grand. She has her black hills and mines with gold so rare. And with her scenery, no state can compare. South Dakota, the state we love the best, land of our forebears, builders of the West, home of the Badlands and Rushmore's ageless shrine. Hills, farms, and prairies Blessed with bright sunshine Thank you, Jay. On behalf of the Trail of Governors Foundation, thank you. Thank you again all for joining us today. This concludes our program. Have a good day. She has her black hills and mines with 
gold so rare and with her scenery no state can compare